600,000 work hours and $4 million saved in one year, 15 times ROI, 60% increased revenue. Do all those results sound impossible? Well, what if I told you those were results from Monday.com customers? When all of your people and data are connected through one work platform, you can achieve more than you ever imagined. Start your free trial at Monday.com. This is live from PS5. Let's go now to our first story. The good people of Manhattan woke up to a gift from their favorite hero. Experts are linking all of these events to an increase in activity on PS5. This was live from PS5, bringing you the extraordinary. Rated RP to M. This episode is brought to you by MGM Plus. Surfer, jewel thief, murderer. Witness the story of television's first true crime celebrity. Murph the Surf is now streaming on MGM Plus. This four-part docuseries explores the tumultuous life of Jack Roland Murphy, a champion surfer turned infamous criminal. Start your seven-day free trial to stream Murph the Surf only on MGM+. The murderer we discuss today is considered to be the most brutal killer to ever have lived. Truly a serial killer that even other serial killers would find absolutely appalling. Additionally, in this episode, we discuss violence and brutality against children and prisoners of war in Ukraine. Please use discretion before listening. Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Hello, welcome back, Francis. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Francis is going to be a super interesting guest, especially with this story we're doing, because it's a story that brings us out of the United States to Russia. And Francis studied anthropology at Harvard. And he is also bringing a unique dad perspective because he's not only an adoptive father, but he's also a stepfather. Anyway, thank you for agreeing this early Saturday morning to do this with me. No, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. I hope I can contribute in meaningful ways. All right, Francis. I'm taking you to the 70s in Soviet Union, but the story is going to straddle pre and post World War II and Cold War. It's December 22nd, 1978, and a nine-year-old girl named Yelena Zakatnova of Rostov, Russia, was making her way home. She's a typical second grade girl who is returning after spending some time with friends ice skating. She's at a bus stop, and she's approached by an older-looking man in a long black coat. And she's surprised because he seems a little gruff on the outside, but then when she speaks to him, he has a sweet, childlike voice. And in true nine-year-old fashion, she's tempted when he tells her that he has gum. She loves sweets, and she really wants the gum, but she has to pee so badly. She tells him, I need to use the toilet, and she politely declines. He tells her that his house is close by and she can use his toilet. She decides that he seems safe enough to follow. And that she does. She follows him down a path to what looks like a shack, kind of in the woods, off in a less populated area. But it's very dilapidated. It's, you know, post-World War II Russia. So that wasn't completely unusual. But still, she's a little apprehensive. And he consents that. She follows him through the creaking plank door that is the front door of this building. The building's barely standing under the pressure and weight of all the snow. And because she is a small child, and I cannot bear to put anyone through the mental tsunami of horror that she went through next, I'm not going to describe it, but I will let you know that her body was found beneath a bridge two days later. (laughs) 
A 25-year-old laborer named Alexander Kravchenko was arrested for the crime. You see, he lived really close to that bus stop, and he had been previously imprisoned for the rape and murder of a teenage girl. And he had done his time, but he's out now. When law enforcement does a search of his home, they find some items with the same blood type as Yelena had, except that's also his wife's blood type. Now, remember, this is the 70s. They don't have DNA typing in Russia at this point. They're just looking at literal blood types. Like, yes, it could be the suspect, but it's nothing like fingerprints and DNA. While Alexander is probably mortified by the thought that he could be returning back to prison, or worse, given where he lives, he remained calm at first because he had an airtight alibi for that day. He was home with his wife and her friend the entire afternoon when this happened. And even the neighbors of the couple were able to verify this to police. However, under the threat of being an accomplice, his wife retracted that alibi and said he had not returned until later that evening. Once again, Alexander is now the number one suspect. And faced with his wife's retraction, he confessed to killing Yelena. He was tried, convicted, and executed. But Alexander Kravchenko was not the real killer. The real killer strikes again three years later. A 17-year-old girl named Larissa Chanko is approached at a bus stop by, yet again, an awkward, quiet man. He lures her into the nearby woods with promise of drinking vodka and relaxing and chatting. But once there, he forces her to the ground and tries to rape her. And I say try, because he can't. This particular killer has one very serious problem. He can only maintain an erection and achieve orgasm while in the process of actually killing someone. So he fills her mouth with mud and leaves to muffle her cries while he strangles her to death and does his business. He bites off a nipple before disfiguring her body with a long stick and his teeth. Despite his amateur attempt at covering the body with leaves and newspaper, Larissa's body was found the following day. The murderer is one of the most gruesome in any history in the world that we have recorded. His name is Andre Chikatilo, and many people haven't heard of him. I actually hadn't heard of him until I was pretty deep into my studies. And Chikatilo would go on to kill child after child, some girls, some boys, all the ages of 9 to 18. He would eventually kill women too, but he starts with the kids. After honing and hunting his luring skills, he ended up developing a pretty consistent and effective pattern for his monstrous activities. He would start with a sweet, normal conversation, and he'd ascertain what they would want, what they'd be interested in. Sometimes it's money, candy, food, alcohol, and he'd gain their trust. He did it quickly. He wouldn't always take whoever he met. If somebody didn't seem like they would be game or didn't seem interested in what he had to offer, he'd move on. His prey of choice were children, runaways, and young vagrants at bus and railway stations. And what happened next became predictable. He'd shepherd them into the forest, where he would slash them with a knife while he raped them and climaxed. Sometimes he'd remove body parts, and he had a penchant for the uterus, one of which he actually chewed on. Uh, this is highly unusual, the, the brutality and the gruesomeness of this guy. Is there... What is that? Like, what, what is unique about that amongst killers? We don't see this often. The reason for his killing we'll get into, but the periphery of it, the, the brutality of it, and the mutilation of the body, that is unusual. And I think you and I will talk about a little bit later about how his childhood actually probably had a, a large influence on his particular style of killing. I mean, the guy's a f- He's a monster, obviously. He's a monster. Serial killers wouldn't like this serial killer because even they can, at times, have some bizarre moral code that they adhere to. And even for, obviously, most don't, but I'm just saying, I've spoken to murderers who were like, oh, but I'm not like that guy. I'd never do that. And even in the world of serial killers, this guy's the worst. So he's kind of in sort of the Dahmer realm, right? Worse than Dahmer. Way worse than Dahmer. So Dahmer, he actually... 
people don't like to hear this, but he actually did care to a degree. He did everything he could. He was a monster also, don't get me wrong, but he didn't enjoy killing people. That's not what he was doing. He was trying to get a body that he could keep who was alive, but like a zombie. He didn't want to have conversation. He was, you know, his goal was also sex, but it was not the kill. This guy had to kill to get off and he didn't care. He didn't care. He didn't try to find another way around that. Dahmer tried to find ways around it all the time. But yes, Dahmer is a freaking monster and I say it all the time, but it's just a different flavor. This guy's even worse. Let's just say that. Yeah, it's just having to kill to climax. It's almost like involuntary, right? It's almost like food, air, Mm -hmm. you know, that's incredibly scary. Yeah, that's a good point. And we'll talk about what's behind that. He's not the only one. This exists, but most people don't end up killing people and, and we'll figure out why not. But shocking as it is, there are people who cannot climax unless they are in the act of killing another person. Chilling. Like the world's worst fetish. We'll get into it. Despite being educated, Chikatilo had this strange superstition that was born from this wives' tale. And he stated that he initially believed that the image of the murderer is left imprinted upon the eyes of the victim. So he would gouge out their eyes. However, he stated in later years that he had become convinced that it was an old wives' tale and he ceased to gouge the eyes out anymore. It becomes part of his trademark. Chikatila went for whomever was the easiest target to lure. And as I said, most often those were children, but he did have some adult victims. And they were usually sex workers or homeless women. Using the same MO that he did with the kids, he would usher them into the woods or some other unpopulated location with the promise of whatever they were needing. And that was typically alcohol and money. After more than five years of this investigators started linking some of these victims. They all had the same MO. Like, it was one of the most consistent pattern of victimology that I've seen, yet it took them five years to start linking it. And we'll talk about, you know, why. So they eventually started considering the reality that they could have a serial killer on their hands. However, efforts by Soviet police to issue warnings to the public during the investigation were hampered because of the country's ideology. They officially stated and asserted that serial murder was impossible in a communist society. It's one of the tenets. That said, internally they were considering it. And ultimately it was the damage to the eye sockets that finally convinced investigators that this was the work of either the same person or the same group of people. There were many theories being thrown around the room about who would do this and why. And because of the complete depravity of the murders, they were looking into cults and and organ harvesting and trafficking. Because as you said, Francis, it's so unusual. I mean, okay, if this person is raping them and he's killing them, that's not unusual. The fact that he's doing it because he can't climax otherwise is something they don't know. But it's the the way he annihilates the corpse that is really unusual. And he's removing body parts. And so of course they they're trying to figure out what this could be. And remember, this is Soviet Union. Was it like ritualistic? Was it the same thing he did each time? No. So he would go after different organs sometimes. There was some consistency. He usually always took the tongue and he would do things to the genitalia and always the eyes. But there would be slash marks in different places. He actually, he said during one of his interrogations that he had to get better at where he placed his stab wounds because he needed to make sure he didn't get blood on his clothing. And these victims would be found with 20, 25 stab wounds all over their body. He ended up starting to kill them slower, especially the adults, and to enjoy the experience longer. I'm sorry. It's even hard for me to say this. Like, this is the worst serial killer I've taken a deep dive on. I mean, obviously, I have meat killers and I talk to them and hearing them describe their crimes to me is way harder in real life. And being next to the person, touching the person who is, you know, brutally raped and killed multiple people. But what this guy did, it's just, it's unparalleled. So not knowing where to start, the investigators start checking on homosexuals, pedophiles, mentally ill, and sex offenders. People forget this. Homosexuality is illegal in a lot of places. Russia was one of them. But 
Did you know that it wasn't even until 1973 that homosexuality was taken out of the DSM as a mental disorder in the United States of America? It was considered a mental illness. I'm so, like, distressed by that. Like, no no wonder people were closeted for so long and had to be anonymous. And that made them prey often. And in this case, in Russia, it made them a potential predator. I'll tell you in a bit what happened to them. But it's the next slang, which is that of a 15-year-old Armenian girl who was living in Russia named Laura Sarkisian. And it had all the trademarks of the previous killings, and it forced the Soviet prosecutor to step in and admit there is a serial killer on the loose now. The investigation is sent on many wild goose chases because numerous young men began confessing to the crime. Remember, I mentioned they are pulling in hundreds of pedophiles, sex offenders, homosexuals, and anybody who spent any time in a psych ward. And they're interrogating them. But just like the interrogation of the suspect from the first kill who was convicted and executed, the Russians' interrogation techniques are draconian. And they were famous for eliciting false confessions, particularly when some of these men were intellectually disabled and easily manipulated. The one bright side of this period when they are performing these interrogation and investigating these killings, they solved more than 1,000 other crimes. 1,000. And that included 95 murders and 245 rapes. The dark side to that was that some of these men, especially the homosexual men who were then outed, committed suicide after the brutal interrogations. Russia at the time was not known for investigating crimes in the air. They, they had a lot going on. They had a lot going on. And we'll get into that. You know, some of these killers were caught. Some of these murders were solved. But they're still not any closer to capturing this particular serial killer. And innocent people are dying along the way, not only from the killer, but from the interrogators themselves. And meanwhile, the bodies kept piling up, and he just kept going. Chikatilo kept going, killing young boys, girls, and women. And the harrowing murders and mutilation of these bodies is so disturbing, like I said, that I'm too uncomfortable to describe it to you. But just imagine every few weeks you get another one. So these frustrated teams of investigators weren't getting any closer, but then... Finally, there's a break, and they think they're getting nearer to the depraved monster who's terrorizing their city. They began placing undercover detectives near bus stations, given that's where all the victims came from, and I am not sure why it has taken them so many years to do that. I got the impression that it it wasn't a very put-together, fluid team we were dealing with here. And then on September 13th, 1984, Chikatilo was caught rubbing his crotch against various women at the bus station. So these undercover detectives stopped him and searched him. They followed him and they asked to see his bag. And in it, they found weapons. He's finally arrested. And when they brought him down, they realized that he fit the physical description of the man who had been seen near the crime scenes. And it looked like this reign of terror was finally coming to an end. But you won't believe this. In an unfortunate turn of events, Chikatilo's blood type, A, didn't match the type of the semen samples, which was AB. They're not taking blood from these crime scenes. They're taking the perpetrator's semen. And from that, you can see what their blood type would likely be, and it didn't match. And so just like that, Chikatilo is no longer the prime suspect, and the murders continue. So weeks turn into months, months turn into years, body after body. And in 1990, now remember, we started this in 1978, after more and more killings were linked to the killer, the news outlets took advantage of the greater media freedom as a result of Glasnost. The Soviet news media was much less repressed than it had been in the earlier years of the investigation. And as such, they were able to say more. They, they now devoted extensive publicity to the case. So the public became additional eyes and ears. Also, the investigators were buckling under the direct threat of being fired for not catching this behemoth of a predator. So they really upped their game, too. And after a few months, on November 6th, 1990, Chikatilo killed and mutilated a 22-year-old woman 
named Svetlana Korostik in a wooded area near the bus station. Shocking. I mean, he's still hanging out at the damn bus stations after he's already been arrested there by undercover detectives. This is the clusterfuck that we were looking at. So when he returns back to the railway platform, railways and bus stations, that's how people got around. And that's where he took every single one of his victims. So after he killed her, he's returning back to the platform and another undercover officer watched him as Chikatilo washed his hands and face in the basin, the water basin. So he approaches him and he notices that Chikatilo's coat had grass and dirt stains on the elbows. Additionally, Chikatilo had a small red smear on his cheek and some deep wound on his finger, right? Boom. Caught. Again. Or so you'd think. Nope. The detective only made note of it when he returned to the police station. Are you frustrated yet, Francis? Well, there's so much going on with this case. I think the time and place in which he did this, how he got away with it. Right. What was going on politically, culturally. We'll get into that because I have some thoughts about all that. You know, I'm just thinking of like, you know, cases that captured the imagination and got so much media coverage and that helped in hastening the arrest of perpetrator. Mm -hmm. Like I think of like Black Dahlia, right? The brutality of that. And that was one. This is Black Dahlia times a thousand. Oh, that's such a good point. That was one victim. That one case was like so brutal, right? I mean, decapitation and mutilation and and that got out and that got out in the press. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, we're still talking about that. Yeah. And that one still captivates everyone's imagination. And as you say, it's one body, but it was gruesome. And that's why people were fascinated because, you know, dead bodies in Los Angeles, that's not that unusual. But to be absolutely mutilated like that was. To your point, a few days later, the 38th body was found back in Russia. And the task force decided to re-examine any person who had been questioned during the previous week. And that included Chikatilo. So they realized that he had been in some of the other cities where murders had been committed. They also found out that he'd been fired from a bunch of jobs because of lascivious behavior. So on November 20th, After six days of surveillance, he's arrested again. So Chikatilo naturally denies any involvement, but he couldn't explain away the large bite mark on his finger that had been left by his last victim. Plus, he's cruising around with a folding knife and rope in his bag. So his blood was taken. Remember that pesky little blood type detail I mentioned earlier that resulted in him being disqualified and subsequently numerous more young people were tortured and killed? It was the fact that Chikatilo's blood type was A, but the semen found on the victims was someone who was thought to have blood type AB. Well, guess what? Chikatilo had blood type A and semen type AB. I looked into this briefly. I don't understand how this is possible. So semen, those are gametes. Those are those are haploids. So they actually can be different. Like you could imagine, they're, I think for for type A, though, they would all be A. So it probably was an error unless I'm misunderstanding how this is done, because by the time I studied crime, we were looking at actual DNA, not blood typing. But for these purposes, they realized that this discrepancy didn't matter. It was him. But still, he denies the killings and interrogators aren't getting very far, which is fucking shocking given how brutal they are. Enter Dr. Bukanovsky. Now, Dr. Bukanovsky was brought in during the initial parts of the investigation because they didn't know who they were looking for. Detectives couldn't figure it out. So he had given an extensive profile of who he thought the killer would be. And here I will quote, and it is amazingly spot on. He writes, the killer is a reclusive man between ages 45 and 50 who had endured a painful and isolated childhood, although throw a rock and rush at that time and that would be everybody. He's incapable of flirting or courtship with women. The individual would be well-educated, likely married, and to have fathered children, but also a sadist who suffered from impotence and could achieve sexual arousal and release only by seeing his victims suffer. The murders themselves were an analog to the sexual intercourse this individual was incapable of performing, and his knife became a substitute for a penis, 
which failed to function normally. Because many of the killings had occurred on weekdays near mass transport hubs and across the entire Rostov Oblast, Bukhanovsky also argued that the killer's work probably required him to travel regularly. And based upon the actual days of the week when he, the killings occurred, the killer was most likely tied to a tight production schedule. Wow. I mean, that dude's really good at his job. Like, that's really good. That's really close. Dr. Bukhanovsky walks into the interrogation room armed with this 65-page report, and within two hours, asshole Chikatilo is bursting into tears and confesses. At first, Chikatilo confessed to 36 of the 38 murders police had linked to him. Later, he confesses to 20 more. But when he's asked about the crimes, I want to just talk about this a little bit because it fortifies what Dr. Bukhanovsky was saying and what we will talk about. It's this disturbing reason he's killing and these unconscionable pleasures he's deriving from it. He said that the victim's cries and the blood and agony gave him, quote-unquote, relaxation and a certain pleasure. He said he often tasted the blood of the victims, which would give him chills and make him shake all over like an orgasm. On November 30th, Chikatilo was formally charged on 53 killings although he admitted to 56. He's brought to trial on April 14th, 1992. And on October 15th, he's sentenced to death. He can be heard kicking his bench in, across his cage when he heard the verdict and he began shouting, abuse! Then on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1994, Chikatilo was taken from his death row cell to a soundproofed room in the Novocherkask prison, and he's executed with a single gunshot behind his right ear. Bye bye You know, I'm not into death penalty, but I am not going to cry when that asshole's killed, except I would like his brain, and they shot it up. All right, we're going to dive into his childhood. Any thoughts, Francis, before we talk about this person ever being a child and not always being a monster? Well, it's scary to think about these cases around the world where they did not have the freedom or investigative power or resources to track these people down. I, it makes me think that there must be so many of these in third world countries where you've got serial killers that are that are unknown and mm -hmm. so many deaths attributed to people doing this type of stuff. But the brutality of this is really shocking. Why he's doing it and what he's doing to these people is is like, I've never heard anything like this. And it's jarring when you're not someone like me who reads this stuff. This one's jarring for me, so I can only imagine it's harrowing for you. Welcome to spending time with your friend, Michelle. <laughs> it kind of reminds me, I, I don't, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but BTK, didn't BTK do... Fine, didn't he, fine didn't, torture kill. Didn't he need to, it was a sexual motivation yeah. there. Something yeah, and like he that. actually lived a totally normal life otherwise. That is that is scary to me. These guys who can just cruise around undetected, you know. It's a lot harder to do that in the United States than it was in Russia, especially back then. You know, I am not an anthropologist or a historian, so I love having you here to talk about what it must have been like. You know, we all know environment plays a part in, in who we are, yet abused people don't all become killers. But what's it like to grow up in a place like Chikatilo did. And I'm going to describe that a little bit. He was born October 16th, 1936 in Yablonchnoye, USSR, which is now Ukraine. And he grew up in the aftermath of the great Ukrainian famine of 1930s, during which millions of people died and some resorted to cannibalism to survive. You know about that era. I've heard you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, and especially today, you're still still seeing the vestiges of that. The conflict in in Ukraine is very tied to a history of of violence, of of aggression, of struggle. But you know, that area, if you go through history, I mean, it's always been an area that has had a lot of conflict. You know, you you can go the Eurasian Steppe has always been a place of transition. Can we um, tell the listeners that you're Eurasian? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Eurasian. But just, you know, particularly that era, like they they had the Ukrainian Holocaust, Holodomor, I think that's how they pronounce it. You know, 1931 to 34, 
You're talking, oh, so it's during that time. It's right during, before he's born. Yeah, right before he was born, you're talking about maybe three and a half to four million people perished because of the results of Stalin's oppressive regime. Collectivization caused famine, you know, and then he used it as a political tool to exterminate Ukrainian identity. So that it was really all about kind of creating this monolithic, you know, communist Russification and Ukrainian kind of identity was was going to be snuffed out. And so they were definitely second class citizens and, you know, were subjugated to horrible, horrible atrocities. Wait a minute. So like what we're seeing now. Like yes, it's exactly. Thing. It's it, that's what I'm saying. It's the the roots of what we're seeing now go go way back, and it was only recently when Ukraine, you know, got independence in 1990 or 91, and then you know they've they've uh, they've made it official the Holodomor, right? You can talk about it. You couldn't talk about it before in you know Bolshevik Russia or Soviet Union, you know, times it didn't exist. You know, so more and more the the Ukrainian identity has 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 come out. You know, even their dialect, their language, and just it's, it's at odds with larger Russia kind of ideals. And so I think as far as Chikatilo is concerned, he was, you know, growing up in the middle of that like extreme aggression, right? Where people were just yeah. being slaughtered and, and yeah, you know, stories of cannibalism that, that is, those are documented. People were so famished and, you know, brutalized that, that they were, they were eating each other back then. You know, his mother told him that he had an older brother named Stepan who was stolen by the neighbor at age four and eaten because they were hungry. That's what Chikatilo was raised thinking. And we don't know if it's true or not. When you're hearing today come out of Ukraine, the Ukraine-Russian war, our stories of brutality, they're quite similar. You know, I mean, what's happening, you know, the atrocities in Bucha, the war crimes, there's a certain... I don't know if we can generalize this or stereotype this, but it, things are happening that are medieval mm. right now today. And it, and it begs the question, well, what, what's going on there? What's in the collective psyche that, that allows people to do that kind of stuff? I know that everybody can be pushed to a certain point in war, but I think this is a theme in that area of the world. I think do you that, think it's just pain is acceptable? What is it about the collective ideology or mindset that allows this to happen again and again? I believe that you're talking about generational hopelessness in mm. autocratic stratified societies where their corruption starts at the top and it goes all the way down to the bottom. There's very little respect for life in those scenarios where you could be subjugated to such horrible atrocities and injustice, but when you get the power, you're going to do it just like they did. Just like they did. You know, it really, it makes a richer picture of how somebody can become so violent because violence sounds like it's kind of acceptable to some degree. Stalin is probably the worst serial killer we mentioned today. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to go by the numbers, you know, you're talking yeah. tens of millions of people that were killed by his order. So you know. Chikatilo, you mentioned collectivism. His parents were collective farm laborers. And what that means is they were not paid for their farming. They were just given the opportunity to farm the land right next to their shack, their one-room home. So they would work all day and all night in order to just be able to farm their own land. So they were as poor as you could be and would often just eat grass to survive. Chikatilo says he never tasted bread until he was 12. I mean, and that yeah. wasn't that uncommon. People were dying from famine. I mean, coming in the collectivization, I mean, Mao did the same thing in China, had the same results, you know, that mm. product productivity, the market economy drives more productivity. And when you force people into that collectivism, that experiment didn't work. It didn't produce enough for people. And they took out the best farmers who, who were invested, who had land, they were wiped out and they were brought in by... You know, it's the idea that like this is extreme example of big government not working. It's the opposite of what we saw in Southeast Asia. It's the opposite of Pol Pot, where he got rid of all the intellectuals and kept all the farmers. He wanted an agrarian society. He didn't want thinkers. He didn't want anyone who could overthrow. They, they, they didn't want thinkers, the Khmer Rouge. They didn't want people who could outsmart them or think them or get the ideas of their own. So they killed all the professors and doctors and, and their children and left all of the Chikatilo type. 
Mm. It's interesting. Like it's a, it's just another ideology, right? It's just another way of controlling people, and you know it works to a degree. I mean, th- this was a long time that this was happening in Russia, right? Yeah, you know, you're talking about the Bolshevik takeover of the revolution in the nineteen nineteen seventeen, and then installation of communism. But even before that, I mean, just thinking culturally as a people, right? This this appetite or this acceptance or tolerance for atrocity. Mm-hmm. Like you go back to medieval times in this area. And, and even before that, I mean, this was always an area that was, like I said, you know, I think an intersection of violence and transition. Go back to the days of the Scythians, you know, Mongol, the Mongol invasions, Viking um, invasions, like it's brutal. Speaking to that, right, like culture, like, you know, Ivan the Terrible, you've heard about the horrible czars and, you know, all of that. There was a culture of serfdom, right? A massive population of people that were slaves and no meaningful kind of resistance to that. Well, and it turns everything I do up on its head because I talk about an individual's trajectory into violent crime, but you're talking about millions and millions of people who either commit it or accept it or can't get out of it. And kind of a mentality that's spanned centuries of this is just how it is. This brings me to my next point of when he's growing up, because now we're getting into Soviet Union joining World War II. And he saw horrifying things. And what does that do to a generation of people witnessing? And what you're saying, it's generation after generation after generation, this comes up. So Chikatilo recalls his father was conscripted into the Red Army, and he witnessed some of the effects of the Nazi occupation in Ukraine. He said he witnessed bombings, fires, and shootings, and that he and his mother would hide in cellars and ditches. And I, while I see that that would be incredibly troubling for a child, I thought it was so interesting that after he had annihilated, decimated murdered countless children. He's like, you want to know what's really horrible? Is watching a fire. So he did say on one occasion that he and his mother were forced to watch their own hut burn to the ground. I mean, I I imagine this has an enormous influence, but what you're saying to me, which I did not read elsewhere, is more of a communal environment that is so packed with atrocities. I just think it's a contributing factor particularly the eras that he, things he experienced and saw. I mean, there was incredible brutality, you know, millions yeah. of people dying. That That is traumatic, right? Well, and he would go to school with his stomach distended. There was some talk, I couldn't verify it, but there was some talk that he had hydrocephalus as a baby, which is water in the brain. And then they attributed his bedwetting to that. And I'm like, wait, 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 there's a much bigger problem. Water on the brain, putting pressure on the developing areas of the brain. And one psychiatrist did say that he thought something likely happened in utero. So we might have a perfect storm of this child with potential brain damage. I'm not, plus growing up in this horrible era in, you know, Russia, you know, this is Soviet Union. And by the way, his sister is, Tatiana is born in 1943, while his father is off at war. It is thought that she's the product of rape by a German soldier, which many, many Ukrainian women were. Yeah, and he witnessed it. it. They're, they're saying he witnessed that. Just an incredibly brutal time. I mean, anyone who has stories of World War II, you know, it's, that was the you know, most harrowing conflict in human history as far as death toll. And you know, to, to have made it through that or been exposed to any of that absolutely has got to have an effect on, on you, I would imagine. Priceline presents, go to your happy price. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. You can see yourself already there. It's beautiful. It might be sunny and sandy for some, neon and urban for others, deserts or rainforests or hiking trails. With Priceline, you can get to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else like up to 60% off select hotels to Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to Priceline.com and travel to your happy place for a happy price. All right, see ya. I'm off to Miami. No, actually, wow, look at that. No, I- I'm going to Hawaii now. Ooh, Cancun looks nice. You know what? Belize looks pretty nice this time of year. Or, mmm, Palm Springs. Go to your happy place for a happy price. 
Go to your happy price, Priceline. It's so easy to, in hindsight, jump into a murderer's childhood and look for the moment, the one thing that made him do this. And while it's tempting, it's it's erroneous because it's just not that simple. He had a lot of risk factors, but so did everybody else in his neighborhood, right? You know, there has to be something about Chikatilo himself. Obviously, this is a perfect breeding ground for criminal behavior. You seeing atrocities everywhere. You're being undernourished. You're being neglected. You are witnessing people you love and care about die. Your neighbors are eating people. You know, sometimes I'll get I'll get these histories of a killer, and it's like, did that really fucking happen? This did happen. I mean, it's historically, like you said, known that cannibalism was a thing. That's what people do when they're desperate. When did he start? What age did he start these crimes? Well, let's see. He was born in, what did I say, 36? And the first, well, his criminal behavior started when he was pretty young. Actually, Chikatilo became a school teacher. And his first victims were students. His first Hill was in 1978, but his first crimes, actually, I was about to describe his first crime. So he discovered that he was impotent when he hit puberty. So I'm imagining that was through masturbation. And he jumped on his sister's 11-year-old friend. He's a much older teenager, wrestled her to the ground and was able to ejaculate as she struggled underneath him. So he discovered, oh, I can under this very weird circumstance. And he did try to have girlfriends. He had his first serious relationship with a local girl. And on three occasions, they attempted intercourse, but he wasn't able to sustain an erection. So she broke it off. And that was all of his relationships. He couldn't achieve orgasm. And then he started getting upset because people were talking about it and His sister kind of wanted to help him. She had moved in with him for a while and realized he was super lonely. Graduates high school. He's one of the only collective farmer children to graduate. He does not get a a scholarship to the university. He eventually does online, not online. (laughs) (laughs) What was online back then? Telegraph. (laughs) Online courses in Russia in the 80s. No, he... (laughs) Chikatilo eventually does correspondence courses and does graduate from college. And he has some other jobs. So he also goes goes into the military for a while, but he comes back out. He's a total communist. He's well-versed in communist history and ideology. He comes back. He's working as a, I believe, a, a telephone engineer. And his sister arranges a marriage for him with a friend, a woman named Feodosia Odnacheva. They married after like two weeks. His sister was just like, please, my poor brother needs needs a wife. He claims that his marital sex life was minimal. And then after a while, his wife understood that he was unable to perform, unable to maintain an erection. So they agreed that she should conceive by him ejaculating externally and then pushing semen into her vagina with his fingers. And this worked. They had a daughter, Lyudmila, in 1965, and four years later, they have a son named Yuri. We're in the middle of the Cold War, right? Yeah, What's yeah. it like so in Russia he's, then? He's, all right, so he, his first crime is 78, you said, so that would make him 42, right? For this type of behavior to present in someone so late, that seems pretty unusual. Well, you're right on. You're spot on because it wasn't his first. So he became a school teacher. And he was caught. He's pretty young still at this point. He was caught sexually assaulting children. At one point, he was with a 15-year-old girl, and he molested her. I mean, he just touched her private parts, and he ejaculated against her as she was struggling against his grasp. And then he sexually assaulted another teenage girl who he locked into his classroom and beat the hell out of her, and he got caught. Faculty also found him masturbating in front of students, He was so obsessed with looking at naked young girls that he would hide in public restrooms to watch them pee. The school knows this, and he's young still, and they encourage him to resign. They don't fucking fire him. So guess what he does? 
he goes and gets another teaching job where he molests more girls and boys at this point. Three jobs, three teaching jobs. He is eventually fired for molesting pupils of both sexes, but nobody calls the police. He's convicted of nothing. He's charged with nothing. If that happened here, even then, in the, you know, in the 80s, you'd go to jail for raping children. But that's not happening. You know, what, what was it like there? So you described this whole, like, pre-World War II Russia. Now it's post-World War II. We're in the middle of the Cold War. What is the feeling? What's it like then? Well, I think there's definitely probably some systemic chauvinism there and sexism. I'm actually surprised that he was reprimanded. I'm actually surprised that, that you know, when people brought complaints, that there was a, you know, system in place that would, would deal with those. And you think in an autocratic society, it's like, no, they, they do whatever they want, right? They say, no, that's not true. Or, you know, when they actually reprimanded him and made him resign, I, I found that kind of, I mean, it must have been pretty, very obvious evidence against him. And the community there was like, hey, this guy's got to go. Otherwise, I would think that, the, you know, the government that they had back then would, would just silence that. That is so that. harrowing. In these autocratic societies, you need to be really careful if you speak up. You know, you might find yourself in jail or worse. You know, imagine living under that. It's, it's terrifying, right? And might makes right. The people who, are, who have the power, they dictate everything. It's a very scary scenario to live in. And I think it just foments and perpetuates this attitude. So you would think that people who want to resist against it would, when they when they have the opportunity, they want to make things right and not perpetuate these same structures. But when they get the power, they do the same thing. Again and again. So and again they and get again. into power by arguing they're going to change it. And then they get there and they're doing the same brutal bullshit. And nowhere more than the history of Russia, history of China recent history, you know, North Korea, places like this, Iran, you know. You know, if this if this podcast, someone listens to it down the road, we are in the middle of Russia's invasion into Ukraine. We're, gosh, we're a year into it. We're a year into it now. It was February last year. Mm-hmm. Arguably, the majority of Russian citizens, 140 million people, believe what they're doing is right. And they believe that they're being threatened by the West via an independent Ukraine. And Ukraine shouldn't exist. And it's always been part of Russia. And their language doesn't exist. And, you know, it's the same thing they said back in 1930, collectively, mm-hmm. right? And it's that. So some of these same things are in play. And, and, and you know, stories I follow the war pretty pretty intensely, as you know. I know you do. But- and I don't know if it's good for my psyche, but it's just... I'm just fascinated that this is going on today in 2023, that we're seeing the level of brutality. I mean, prisoner executions, torturing. It's it's really wild. And and it is the most extreme things I've heard and, and are reading about are coming from the Russian side, are coming from, you know, private military contractors like the Wagner Group, you know, conscripts. They they're they're you know, this Wagner group has gone to the prisons and they've conscripted prisoners and put them on the front line as cannon fodder. Who better? Who better to fight your war than murderers? But you've got a whole nation of people that are okay with that. Mm. They're like, yeah. That's that's taken right out of World War II playbook, right? Like Nazi playbook to go to release prisoners to fight for you. Yeah. I mean, I think that there was some of that, but not, I, I didn't think that they found it very effective. You know, but there was try it again now. There, there was actually one division in the Nazi army that was uh, uh, prisoners made up of prisoners or criminals, former criminals, and they were, you know, no surprise, they were the most brutal group wow. responsible for all kinds of horrible atrocities. So you grab guys like the guys I study, and you form an army of brutal murderers, and you get an effective team fighting on your side. Damn. Yeah, you know, what like kind a- of monster thought of that? It's, you know, you have a, a terror squad, right? They go out there and you almost, it's, it's like PR, you know, for you for, to instill fear in the other side that you've got this, you know, battalion of, of, of murderous thugs that will skin you alive, you know? There are actually okay. stories, there's actually stories right now where 
this group, this particular group, Wagner group, have they've they've skinned people alive and kept them alive via IV drip. Stop it. Why? Um they've been making snuff films and making Stop money it. on the side. Yes, this is the type of stuff happening. This is a different kind of podcast. We need to cover that. They're making snuff films of be- torturing Ukrainians? Yes. There's such desperation, hopelessness, corruption. These guys are realizing, "Hey, we can we can make money on this on the side." And this is what they're doing. But that blows up everything. Like, you know, we study the genetic effects and the environmental effects that can push somebody over the edge and why somebody doesn't have guilt, remorse. It's a perfect place to breed somebody like Chikatilo and a perfect place for him to operate because yeah. obviously he has all the risk factors for becoming criminal. And he also is in a place where, I mean, the bodies aren't really being investigated and you can't have a serial killer in a communist society, you know, that that's, that's a tenant. So boom, perfect storm for somebody like Chikatilo. Now Chikatilo wasn't killing just for the sake of killing. He was killing because it's the only way he could achieve orgasm. Now, we call that paraphilic disorder. Paraphilic disorders are a group of mental health condition that cause recurring and intrusive sexual thoughts and behaviors. And that can include children, non-consenting adults, inanimate objects. There's paraphilia, which is being sexually aroused by things that aren't typically sexual. Fetishes, you know, it you can have that. It becomes a paraphilic disorder when it either is distressing you and interrupting your life or potentially causing harm to someone else. So you're going to act on it. Him being turned on and achieving orgasm from killing, if he didn't act on it, if it was just all like he masturbated to horror movies, that would be paraphilia. But the fact that he's actually doing the killing makes it the worst paraphilic disorder you can have because Pedophilia is also wrapped up into that, isn't it? That's what, who his victims are. Now, people with paraphilic disorder are not typically criminal, but you can see how they can be. If they aren't treated, if they aren't, if there's no intervention, and if they are maybe growing up the way Chikatilo grew up and maybe lacking any regard for human life like Chikatilo clearly lacks, you can see if that's your paraphilic disorder and you're getting away with it and you don't give a shit. That's how he was able to kill 53 to 56 people, kids, young women. I mean, that probably wouldn't happen here. It needed to be somewhere like Russia. Mm. I mean, it was, like you said, it's a perfect storm, like the, the conditions for someone like this to exist. You do get this kind of explosive effect of being born with a predisposition toward criminal behavior, whether that's, you know, born genetically have it, or you end up with some head injury or brain trauma, and then you become predisposed to violence, mix that with any sort of environmental trigger. Repetitive trauma, it changes your brain. We've seen it. It changes the way your brain functions. It changes the morphology of your brain. So you can't discount trauma. And Chikatilo, everyone in his neighborhood was experiencing trauma. So if you have some sort of predisposition toward violent crime and you are having repetitive trauma, traumatic event after traumatic event, it's not a far stretch to become a murderer. And let's also add on paraphilic disorder. You have this strange inability to enjoy sex the regular way. And it's a little unclear exactly what causes paraphilic disorder, but they suspect, just like with almost everything else, it's a combination of neurobiological, genetic, cognitive, and interpersonal factors like Chikatilo's environment. And some studies have actually found elevated levels of serotonin and norepinephrine in people with paraphilic disorders, along with decreased levels of DOPAC, D-O-P-A-C. So criminal predispositions can have a biological root. So can PDD, paraphilic disorder. Treatment for it, it's crucial. Now we're going to get into another big fucking societal problem. It is crucial with somebody with paraphilia that could lead to paraphilic disorder, get help as early as possible. It's measured as early as two years old. I don't know how. I don't know if everybody is presenting with features that can be diagnosed that young, but some people with paraphilic disorder do show symptoms at very young ages. And they say 
at those young ages, you can jump in with, I need you to not be on your phone because we are being filmed. And this might be the scene that goes on TikTok. I was looking up anhedonia. Oh, that's the lack, that lack of uh, experiencing pleasure. It made me think like this paraphilic disorder, if there's a link to depression, anhedonia, culturally, Russia has the highest, I believe, per capita incidence of alcoholism and depression oh. in the world. I, I could be wrong, but it's up there. And you think oh. of, you know, they're just their their artistic output, right? I mean, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. It's like it's about talking about how miserable really, you are uh, in, in like a beautiful life is way. Just pain. You know, yeah. yeah. And and there's just, I mean, we're making gross generalizations, but you know, it's interesting to think about these things, right? I mean, in my interest in culture, you kind of have to make these generalizations. You know, you you you're trying to make sense of populations, right? Um, so, if, as an anthropologist. You get that kind of latitude where you can make generalizations of, you know, across great swaths of people. And it's an interesting position for somebody like me who looks at an individual's trajectory into crime, taking into consideration things like, where do they come from? And it, it's certainly in this particular case, I haven't thought about it from an anthropological perspective. You know, America is a very young country and we look at certain cultural influences and genetic influences that exist in certain cultures and and we do consider that but the entire nation during certain points of time in Russia is everyone's experiencing trauma you can't escape it so you're this kid there's no way he's getting help right so if he had shown right around puberty that this was happening that he was starting to hurt children and molest them you could jump in cognitive behavioral therapy it needs to be included at all levels and, in, and sometimes if you jump in with children you can reverse the course of a paraphilic disorder. So let's say, I mean, they do all these strange things like, you know, masturbatory suspension, and then they make you habituate to certain things. I, I can read them. They're really weird. Medication is the is often the first line, and that's when they, they use anti-androgen treatments. So it reduces testosterone, which reduces sex drive, but that's just treating the symptom. Some other, I mean, I don't know how avant-garde some of this is and how regularly it's used. Cognitive behavioral therapy is almost always used. The anti-androgens are almost always used, especially if somebody's eking into criminal behavior. But there's this argument that you can do these other things that might bump somebody off of this really bad path that could lead to criminal behavior and also just makes their life really difficult. So some of it is kind of like intervening, trying to teach empathy about the people who are could potentially be hurt. So if you're a voyeur, if you're a frauderist that's master like rubbing up against people, you know, and, and I've had that and my sister's had that where we've been on like public transportation in various places and have people rubbing against us. And I the fact that that's a like a, it has a name. People do that. That's a thing. Frauderism. And then pedophilia, sexual sadism, voyeurism, those will have victims potentially. So that's one approach. And there's covert conditioning where whenever you they encourage you to masturbate while thinking of these things that aren't sexual, and then they shock you. And it's supposed to work like in a similar way as food poisoning does. Like, you know, I can't eat beets. I cannot even be near a beet. I can throw up when I think of a beet. It's that kind of idea behind that reconditioning, masturbatory extinction, masturbatory satiation. And that's where like they'll encourage you to masturbate. And then like you you have to continue after you ejaculate masturbating to these things that normally turn you on for an hour. And by the time you're done with that, you're like, you never want to see it again. Or they have you masturbate to whatever it is that turns you on, maybe it's feet. And then at the end, right before you climax, they make you look at something that is sexual, like an adult body. And so they kind of retrain your brain to associate the climax with something that is sexual. So these are some approaches to pulling somebody off the trajectory. But suffice it to say, the earlier you get in there, your child is exhibiting these behaviors, you get in there with cognitive behavioral therapy. That's where you begin. What do you think the problem is with that, Francis? How do you administer that to a young child? Cognitive behavioral therapy is absolutely easy to administer to a young child. But where do you go? Who are you going to go talk to? Who are you going to say, hey, my teenage boy is turned on by images of naked children? We don't have a safe place for that. We live right now in the most complicated time given things like pedophilia. And here's why. 
whether we want it to exist or not, it does. There's a small group of the population that's sexually attracted to children. It does not mean they act on it. But that's just an undeniable truth. Well, we can call them monsters and, and hide them away, but we don't know where they are. What's the alternative? Treatment. Okay, well, what does a safe place look like to seek out treatment for somebody who's like, shit, I'm turned on by children? I mean, do you see that problem with this? You're not going to tell anybody because, first of all, you think you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life. But second of all, who the hell wants to admit this? But don't we kind of need it to be admitted so it could be treated so that they aren't attacking children under the guise of you know, being normal and under the cover of night? I think that's a really, really interesting dilemma because so many things in our society are destigmatized, you know? Sexuality, gender fluidity, you know, mental illness. But this is like still a third rail. Yeah, you don't touch this one. Uh-uh. You know, it's like... You don't touch I, I, paraphilia. No, and and I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, you know, what... but early intervention is is necessary in mm-hmm. order to, you know, preclude any horrible crimes and abuse happening, right? I think we're going down that that road, but I can't think of a worse stigma to have than being a pedophile. Think about pedophiles who go to jail. They're they're in they're in protection. They have to be protected from the rest of the population because they'll be annihilated. And that's that hierarchy of criminal morality, too. Like, even at the worst criminals in the world, some of them have their own social moral code that they stick to. And pedophiles, as you say, are the worst of the worst. They're the ones who get killed in prison. So we're, in, we're at this juxtaposition where we can't treat them because we can't destigmatize it because it's just too bad. So they exist without treatment and then become, therefore, more likely to hurt our children. Yeah. No, it's 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 something that needs to be addressed and there needs to be a place where we can intervene early. Absolutely. Yeah. I have no solution for this. Just more questions. Okay, Francis, what else? What what else do you want to talk about with Chikatilo and Russia? I don't know. I think it's it's super fascinating to me just looking at a uh, history of people and this is this is an example of what I think can happen in the perfect storm scenario of being exposed to such horrible trauma throughout one's life, you know, living in a autocratic repressive society that Mm -hmm. perpetuates the atrocity and, you know, just not having resources to intervene. And then, you know, something clearly wrong with this person, right? Right. Something, there's something genetically there because like you said, there were countless other people, thousands, millions of other people who experienced the same traumas, and they didn't end up cannibalizing and brutalizing and murdering people like this guy did. I do think that if he had been born in a different society, the outcome could have been different. Right. You can't study in a vacuum, right? Crime doesn't typically happen in a vacuum. So your point is is well taken that any one of these factors has an influence, but if you take out where he was raised in Russia at that time, it might have been a totally different outcome. I suspect there's a lot more serial killers during that time that we don't know about because even just there's just happened to be another child killer who lived near the bus stop who ends up being executed for this crime he didn't even do. Like, how many are there in that small neighborhood? Like, there's something to that that I imagine we would find, given all of those risk factors we've discussed ad nauseum, that there probably was a tremendous number of killers running around that time and not necessarily serial killers. People are killing just for whatever personal gain that they need. Some of it's desperation, right? You're going to feed your family. You need to feed your family. Some of us would turn to crime if our children's lives are on the line, right? Just out of curiosity, you know, in, in times of war, horrible things happen that go undocumented or get a pass. You know, the, a lot of them categorize as war crimes eventually. But, you know, we're, what we're seeing right now, particularly in Ukraine, there could be these things happening. There, there are these types of things happening right now. There are individual actors who are committing serial murder. Mm-hmm. How do you classify that, address that in your, you know, expertise? Like, do you 
is that a different category? Like things that happen in war, like we don't go there. Right. You know, I, I have not spent a tremendous amount of time studying wartime separate actors. Lots of people study what can make a normal person become a member of the military during wartime and then go back to being normal again, well, with the associated PTSD. But somebody who would not normally be a torturer or a murderer can become that during war. There are, you know, there are all sorts of labs that study that. But this idea of, oh, gosh, I can get away with anything right now. So an individual actor becoming a a wild murderer, I have not dug into that. And I don't know anyone who has, but that is what I'm going to do next because I'm fascinated by this. It's it's kind of a final frontier for me because I mainly study killers from the United States and primarily looking at them, factors in childhood, genetic, biological, neurological factors that we can, that can explain some of the individual differences because obviously environment has a lot to do with it. But we, we say this all the time. If being abused as a child is all that it takes, then you're going to get a lot more murderers than we have. Why is it some kids can be go through horrific abuse and be totally unscathed and some cannot? There's individual factors, right? An individual risk factor or protective factor or a multitude of both that either push you toward crime or protect you from it. Now, what you're talking about is people who take advantage of a war-torn area and are like, whoa, become criminal that way. And you know what? You're going to come back on because I'm going to do a deep dive and we will get into that again in another episode. I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out what people have learned. Fantastic. Thank you, Francis. You are brilliant and you know a lot of things that I don't know anything about. So I appreciate having you on here and- You know, you can argue with me and disagree with me because I know from an anthropological perspective, you more than most people, I think, believe in redemption and that we are a product of how we were raised, which we are. And I know that you and I have gotten into some really interesting intellectual discourse about things that are beyond our control. And it is frustrating to think that there are some things about us that have nothing to do with where we were raised and aren't going to be changed and there are things about our children that we have no influence over. And it's, people don't like it. I don't like it. I still parent the hell out of my children, even though some research says that very little of what I'm doing during certain ages of their lives mean anything. I hate that. So I ignore it. No, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I've always, the way I was raised, and you want to believe in human agency. You want to believe that, that people can be redeemed, that, mm-hmm. that it's worth fighting for. It's worth caring. It's worth you know, helping those less fortunate, all those things, because you think that, okay, well, I can make a difference, that I can change things. And in talking with you, I, I've learned to kind of balance that more, that like, mm-hmm. no, there, there's very, very strong genetic factors as well. And maybe all we can do is manage that. Nudge you know, it. M- nudge it one way or the other to have a better outcome. But so it's not obsolete, you know, it's still very important, I think, but it's more of a gene and environment interaction. When you come back next time, I want to talk to you specifically about that because you've raised children who aren't genetically related to you. And, you know, that must be interesting to kind of see things pop up that, you know, aren't arriving there via vis-a-vis your parenting that are coming from some tendency that exists elsewhere from, you know, people you don't even know, you know, genetic influence Mm -hmm. from people you don't even know. So I want to touch on that next time because I think that's absolutely fascinating. Definitely. No, I mean, there's, there's affirmations for both sides of that. Mm -hmm. You know, that like when you love. Yeah. When when you see your child modeling or when you see your your child start doing something that you've done in front of them or you've taught them, you know, a hundred percent, that's not genes operating. That's your parenting. They are modeling your parenting. So you, you actually have a pretty decent experiment to look at how much of some behavior is modeling versus some sort of other biological or genetic influence. That's an interesting perspective that I want to dive into. And that's bad habits too. So if you see your child mimicking some of your bad habits, you're like, oh, I know that they're getting that from me. (laughs) And it's not from tacit genes I've given them. It's from my parenting. Thank you, Francis. You're the best. I really appreciate you doing this. And this has been How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. And we will see you next time. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook. 
with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N T R A S K. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Hello, the world. We are They Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I'm Courtney Eck. And I'm Sadie Eck. And we are sisters that want to tell you about lesser known murders. Our cases are always compelling, maybe even a little scary, with just enough banter to keep it interesting. You can find us at theywillkill.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts. See you there. See ya. See ya.